Yeah. Have you been watching anything cool? Uh, let's see. What did I just finish watching? We, I was just watching The Outsider again. Uh, oh, really? Show uh, with Jason Bateman. He's like one of the directors. I feel like it was shot by one of the uh, Ozark DPs, but I haven't done the research to figure out who was shooting it, actually. Wonder, let's find out, because I interviewed uh, one of them. His name was Eric Koretz, who was very uh, cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it has a very similar look and style. It's pretty dark. I haven't seen that show. Oh, it's, of course it's Stephen King. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty It's pretty wild, you know. So you were just re-watching it? Yeah, my wife put it on, and I was like, I think we've seen this already, but I can't remember what happened, so let's watch it. Yeah, oh, dude, I do that all the time. They're like, what, what were we doing here? Ah, eh, fuck it, we'll just watch it again. Been watching the- that, like Loki. Looks great. Yeah. Uh, Isaac Baum, uh, Bauman shoot. Bauman, the- yeah. I've been shooting the second season. Yeah, so. he uh, he was another guy who was really uh, educational to talk to. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. He's very talented. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Uh, he like takes these pictures where it like all looks super dark, but they have like a really banging eye reflection. Um, just really super cool stuff. I always wonder, like, I feel like that has to be one of the most, um, maybe not contentious, but like, Every DP has their own opinion about whether or not to include an eye light or sure. just let it be the key, you know? Definitely. <laughs> like, I feel like that's the most, that's probably what most people would fight over more than anything. <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, I get, I feel like you get that question a lot and, uh, like everybody has a wildly different answer and if you're doing it right. It should be there already. Yeah. 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 You hear that one a lot. Yeah. I, I saw on your, uh, on your website that you started in the military. Uh, yeah, well, I started working for the military. Gotcha. I, I actually, I did go to West Point, but I didn't end up graduating. Um, mm. and then how, you know, through my path of the career ended up working as a contractor for the military. Um, I worked for the enterprise multimedia center. We were like a regional facility that we handled. Kind of like everything that was above what like a garrison, you know, little vil- video department would handle, um, but like below the like official be all you can be um, right. commercials. So we kind of like did everything in between um, and like we were only supposed to cover from like the Mississippi to the east because at that po- point I was in Virginia, um, but we ended up, we were the first organization that kind of stood up completely so we were covering all over the country i was you know shooting in fort Irwin, out here in california um texas kansas city leavenworth all over the place so um i was mainly just like videographer camera operator kind of thing Mm. Uh, but yeah we got got to like get a lot of experience just like holding a camera and uh running around following a squad doing something uh, even sometimes we would do like MOS videos and we made, which is like the, the military occupational specialty. Uh-huh. Uh, so like I, we made a video for combat camera. So basically like the soldier was following somebody with a camera and then we were following them and it was, and all the actual people playing the war games had uh paintball guns. So like you, the cameraman, you could actually be hit and it was supposed to kind of give you the idea of like, well, this is what it's like. You're actually, you're out there shooting, but you have to take cover too. Right. Of course, like, I don't think the people were shooting at each other. I think they were just shooting at the, the cameraman. So right. I mean, we definitely took a lot of hits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like, not today, kid. But that- <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, what was, what was that kind of, um, experience like in, con- um, in comparison to a kind of normal, you know, commercial or music video set? Cause I imagine, you know, the military is nothing if not regimented with, you know, you got to do this and this and this, and it doesn't feel like. Well, I, I know it's a it's kind of a misconception that the military isn't a place for creativity, but I think at certain levels it's encouraged, not most levels. Um, sure. But yeah, what what was kind of the what a did you learn from that experience that you were able to take into you know traditional um, film work, but also like what kind of were those differences? Um, I guess what I would have learned would probably be like patience and um, you know just learning how to like roll with the punches. Um, because you're dealing with such a big organization, lots of red tape and bureaucracy, um, it does it definitely 
doesn't move like a film set or an AD would want things to move. Uh -huh. There's a lot of process that takes in, goes into things. So, you know, it's a lot of like hurry up and wait to get things going. So, uh, I, I would say like they, they focus a lot less on the creative, you know, because there's a lot more going on than just your video. So like, usually if, if you're shooting a video and, and you're dealing with some sort of specific training that a lot of times, like you're involved in that training. So you're like taking a squad that is physically going through that training. So you have to wait for them to get there or wait for them to be set up or reset or whatever it takes. So just lots of logistical things coming into it. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, just figuring out ways to make it creative and it's in a situation where it's just out you out there with the camera by yourself, you know, running through the woods with these guys. Yeah. I imagine lighting wasn't a, uh, primary concern of and certainly not in those situations. I mean, we did plenty of like interviews as well. Um, sure. so like uh, we were located right near like Trey doc, which is training and doctrine, doctrine command. It's like all the four-star generals and stuff like that in the army making decisions and policy. So we were constantly doing that kind of stuff too. Um, but certainly like more at a videographer type way, you know, just like me showing up all, you know, by myself or with one other person in the director and like just, just making it happen versus having a big crew and, um, you know, a lot of creative that's going into it. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what was the process going from that into, cause you've worked on some really, uh, like, uh, uh fantastic looking ads Thank and you. I'm wondering, you know, going from a situation where, you know, it was more about the content than the flair, so to speak. Sure. Like how, how were you able to hone that, you know, creative eye to get, you know, a Lamborghini commercial or, um, like that Patrick star bit that looks really good. Or, I mean, it all looks really good, but I was just going through your website and it's like, it all has such high polish. The glow forge ad you're selling a, a, a fucking printer basically. And it looks incredible, you know? No, thank you very much. I, I do appreciate that. I mean, one thing was like, since I did kind of have a lot of experience just running around with the camera, um, I decided I wanted to, I was ready to be more creative and get into a market that like was bigger and it had more opportunities. And I was like, California, that's like the way to go. So I, Decided I would get like my MFA and kind of get a loan to help me get across the country. And then since I had a lot of experience behind the camera, um, when I got out here, I was like, all right, I'm going to really focus on lighting. Um, I feel like that's really what's setting the, the, the good stuff apart from like just mediocre things and really helps telling the story and, and pushing the boundaries. So kind of like threw myself hundred percent into lighting and was like, gaffing as many of everybody else's projects as I could when I wasn't shooting my own and just like doing everything I could to just fully immerse myself in it. And I think film school is a great way to, to do that. Um, certainly like focus completely on watching movies, studying movies, hanging out with people that all you're, they're doing is watching movies and, and studying. And yeah, I just was able to through all that practice, you know, kind of come out with my own style a little bit and um definitely always trying to push the look and you know always have feels like it's a smaller budget and then we're we're trying to do something bigger with it um even as the budgets get bigger then the creative gets bigger too so it always feels like you're trying to come up with creative ways to make that money work even if you got a whole bunch of it right yeah, the the film school question always comes up, uh, especially for students or prospective students, I should say, or people, you know, and I feel like there's always like half of the people usually online um, try to say like, oh, you don't need it. You can just watch my videos, you know, whatever it is, whatever they try to sell you. I sell a masterclass. Um, but there is something that you don't get from even like really well-written books or, or, uh, you know, Jay Holden Shotcraft, I think is probably one of the most important books to come out for f filmmaking in sure. decades. Cause I mean, it's just every piece of knowledge put together, but the one thing you don't get from something even as great as that resource is the, um, the stuff you learn on set working with people The I think the personal, I was just talking to another guy right before you. And we were talking about how like the interpersonal element doesn't often get taught probably at AFI, but doesn't often get taught at, uh, many film schools. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think 
at being from Chattanooga, I think we have a unique experience that we are sure. like really close to LA, but also 45 minutes to an hour away from LA. So, um, <laughs> Instead of some of the film schools that like seem to be a little bit more cutthroat and everybody's trying to like do better than their project, it feels like we had more of a cohesive kind of community. Mm. And I felt like we had some great instructors, definitely the best, you know, Bill Dill and uh, Johnny Jensen, ASC, both ASC guys and complete polar opposites. Like one guy was super technical and like helped you figure out all the way down to like how much the photo sites are like filling up with specific types of lights or whatever. And then the other Johnny's just kind of like feel it from your heart, you know, like just fucking do it kind of guy. And it's like the marrying those two together was great. But then also every weekend you're on set, you know, with your, with the guys that you're there every, you know, you're just kind of bouncing from project to project and the DPs are rotating, but like you worked on his project. So he works on your project, that kind of thing. He or she, um, <clears throat> you know, and it just like everybody's, building and learning and growing and i feel like you know the rising tide kind of raises all ships in that situation and like yeah like i said we're a little bit farther away so i feel like it forces you into like that kind of community where there's not a lot of other sets for them people to be branching out to work on so like you end up working together all the time and uh yeah it just it was a great environment to learn and grow and try things um Certainly, I'm still paying for it, and I'll probably be paying for it a, for a long time. So yeah. I don't know. My advice might be to like live next to the film school, right? You know, like, like just work, work on a couple yeah, things. Work on the film projects over the you know during the weekends, and then like eventually, like you'll be in the class talking about the projects with the people or something. You know, just because you're on set every weekend. But yeah, we definitely had people like that, or people from another school that just like. They were always on set and once people realized they were an asset, they were always there and they ended up, you know, just as good as all the rest of the guys that graduated with me. So, yeah. Well, and just, I think too, like it sounds like with Chapman, but I think, um, on, at some of those big schools, I, I went to Arizona state, so I didn't, you know, <laughs> but, uh, I imagine that kind of, I need to stand out behavior is antithetical to being on a team that is be, another thing about the military is they're like you know this is a team you are not an individual sure um and i i i have thought often about the the similarities between like military groups not like the, not like the army but just like you know um i don't know what you call it but the group of the group of people that are one unit you know and how that yeah yeah and how that kind of applies to filmmaking often but uh, anyway, um, the uh, what was I going to say? The Chapman Film School. No. Oh yeah. So you said uh, both the teachers. You know, one was real technical, one was real kind of uh, holistic, maybe or like uh, emotional. Feel it. Yeah, just feel it. Which they both uh, were in touch with your emotions. That you know, trying to tell. Sure. <laughs> like one of them, we would would have like all the apps out, and you know, you're. You're reading and getting measurements for everyone, and the other ones like just trust. You know, it's all about what you feel, what your eye. Trust your eye, right? Which uh, still getting a reading, you know, making sure sure. exposing properly. Which uh, which one were you drawn to more? Uh, I mean, both of them actually. You know, like Bill, who was the more technical one. Like I, he was like my main teacher. I had more classes specifically with him, and then Johnny, like. I ended up being one of the TA, his a TA for one of his classes. So I was I ended up getting very close with both of them. And I think that's like, I'm kind of right there in the middle. I have all that technical knowledge and then I like to just kind of feel it and, you know, light from the heart and let it come through there as opposed to like getting too specific about like my readings. And I'd rather just take one reading and kind of base everything on that than, than get too specific about making sure every single thing is where I need it to be on my light meter. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, 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 I think I said I should put this on a t-shirt like two podcasts ago, but, uh, I've said a hundred times that, um, emotionally correct usually trumps, uh, technically correct, especially when it comes to narrative. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, emotional continuity, like always, I'll take that over lighting continuity any day. You know, I'd, I'm, I love to flip the key and sometimes script supervisor might flip out. Like it's not coming from that direction. No, but it's emotional continuity. It feels, feels right. 
<laughs> yeah. They'll accept it. Well, and, but on the other side, you know, like I was talking about with all your commercial work, like it's, it's so polished. Uh, what, what do you think kind of goes into making those, um, those types of ads and, and, and making sure the producers are happy and the clients happy. And like, what, what are some of those maybe, um, I don't know if there's tricks necessarily, but things that seem to come up often around those ads that kind of every, all those clients kind of tend to want. Uh, I mean, I think everybody is looking for it to look good and look slick. And then at the same time, you know, they want their face fully exposed and making sure that like they have really nice, soft light that that's hitting them and it's not bringing out the blemishes and all of that stuff so i think it's like pushing the the envelope like you would in narrative and then you know just making sure there's something extra there to expose in those places that you need um right. and then just kind of getting a good idea and uh being on the same page of the creative with the directors and the producers and trying to from the very get-go planting ideas and pushing things a little bit further um, so it's not like a surprise on the day of you told them like, oh, let's, we're going to go silhouette at this point and you're not going to, we're not going to see anybody's faces, but it's going to come back later and we're going to identify who everybody is. Um, so then like everybody's ready and prepared and excited about those risks that you're taking as opposed to like you show up on the day and, and try to do those silhouettes and you know, it's a makeup ad and they don't, you know, they want to see the face, you know, so. Right. Certainly there's always a little bit of that. I think I, sometimes I feel like if, you know, if I don't get asked to add a little bit more light, sometime I'm not like pushing myself hard enough. Sure. You know? Yeah. Gotta, I gotta walk that line. They're always like, uh, are you sure we can see that? And you're like, yeah, 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 it's fine. The colorist will figure it out. Like, <laughs> it's all there. It's all there. Don't worry. Yeah. Got to show them no. a log. You're like, hey, yeah. See. Usually like always have a little bit of safety whether it's in the lud or you know something like that to pushing it down so feels a little bit dark here it's probably just right you know in the yeah there does seem to be a a, what i find to be a a, um nice push towards like more kind of contrasty interesting ads unless you're you know a bounty ad is pretty much all white but uh you know anything else or just some some ads where it's like a car ad and it's just like the interior of the car, someone talking, like narrating, and then that's okay. the whole thing, you know? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, like certainly television in general is just pushing and going darker and uh, with all these uh, great cameras that can capture so much information in the low light, like uh, we're really pushing the boundaries and... Um, <clears throat> You know, ads are trying to sell lifestyles and, you know, be a spe- very specific thing, make people feel a certain way. And, you know, what better way to make you feel like a life of luxury than be sitting like in the nicest car with the nicest materials and the nicest looking images that you can. Super soft lenses and good contrast, rich, like, you know, everything looks like a movie these days. And you yeah. Know, Unfortunately, you might say that TV is better than movies right now just because like the stories and things they're trying to do, the things they're trying to tell are like not superhero th- movies and it's like more grounded and cooler storytelling is happening. And then, yeah, like we are able to take more chances. Um, you know, there's always arguments now over like, did they go too dark? You know, like, are you trying to watch the Game of Thrones in the middle of the day with all your windows open and you can't see or like. You know, and is your internet connection five meg like this? Right. One of the biggest things I'm always talking about is like buy Blu rays. Like, I'm telling you, you're gonna, your experience will be vastly different if you just watch whatever, whatever the season eight of Game of Thrones on a Blu ray. Yeah. No, that's, that's true. And like, there's the image by the time it gets to the television these days, you have no clue like where it really is. And then TVs are doing all kinds of things inside of them to make the experience better but like driving us all crazy as filmmakers so yeah there's only like it's funny because they just always seem to assume that uh the tv manufacturers that the majority of the con and maybe there's a there's a study that this is true but like the majority of users are only watching their television for sports like why does motion smoothing come on it like default yeah i mean i guess it's because Every, it's always around the Super Bowl, right? Like that's the big TV, CV, uh, TV selling time of year. So, yeah. you know, 
they're preparing for that, I guess, to show the big game on, you know, in Best Buy. You know, that's that's something that AI should fix. AI, the TVs need AI where it knows what channel you're on sure. and applies the correct, you know, or just what content you're, you know, oh, I see this is hockey. We're going to put on sports mode or whatever, motion smoothing. Oh, this looks like a movie or a TV show. We're putting on filmmaker mode or whatever that Samsung LG thing Absolutely. is. Absolutely. I mean, I know I've had some TVs that have some form of that auto in there, but like you, you can't trust those things to make the right decision. So no. turn it all off. My, yeah, my TV has a uh, game mode. It knows when the PlayStation's on, but I don't know what game mode is. I don't know. Like, I, is it, it says it has 120 hertz. Yeah. Maybe the, the refresh rate goes up and yeah. Uh, at but. some point, you know, your eyes can't see the difference anymore. And it's just the Sony is selling you something or yeah. Well, and, or if the content, you know, what's the point of 120 hertz refresh rate on a TV if the content is shot at 24p? Sure. Like it's not, <laughs> no one's going to notice. You're just inventing frames and. Yeah. Uh, do you, uh, do you find that, um, did you, or, that was a strange question. I'm like, somehow the caffeine has completely worn off in the last 15 uh, minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Caffeine shot going, dude. Right, uh, just find some pre workout. Uh, did you do you are you a um physical media person? Do you like did you kind of learn on special features? Like, I know a lot of people, I certainly did. Sure, yeah. I mean, like, for the longest time, I prided myself on my big bookshelf full of DVDs, and you know, I was loved when Blockbuster was going out of business because it was like right. five for 20 bucks, you know, getting all the all my favorite films. Um, and then slowly, you know, I didn't have cable at the time. And then slowly, like the streaming sources, you know, services got better and better. And it got to the point where it was like, I wasn't taking them out anymore. And I eventually, I don't have it anymore, but certainly like so many tips and tricks picking up, like, you know, Deacon's talking about, I think it was on prisoners. Like, he was like, oh, I couldn't find a place to put a, a light. So like, I just put a, a news van there and opened the door and that's where the light's coming out of. Oh, that's a pretty interesting way to do it. So uh, lots of cool things. And so I, and that's like, and now it's like documentaries, I guess, right? They have like a little documentary that goes with it and, or after the episode, they talk about it or something like that. Yeah. I find that cause I'm a giant special features nerd and, uh, I find that it, it can be disappointing those little like after show. Cause the, instead of it being like an interesting doc, it's kind of just an ad for the show you just watched. Sure. Like there's, I can't remember what movie it was. I think it was like, it wasn't Moon. Maybe it was like a Guillermo del Toro movie. It was like, so, like Guillermo has like two hour long, you know, dead. but uh, where they're just show it's, it was probably early 2000s and it's just someone running around with a handicap and you're watching like he department heads argue with each other. And I'm like, you would never, like Marvel would never put out no nope. special videos of people at each other's throats about something. Well, they, they don't get to have that creative process in Marvel, right? It yeah. <laughs> comes from the top. There's only one person in it, Darth Vader. Um, I did want it because obviously you're here to talk about the uh, Beyond Belief show. Uh, how, how'd you get involved in that show? And also, where am I allowed to stream it? <laughs> um, well, right now, you can really only stream it in Germany. Um, that I mean, makes sense because I was shit struggling. Yeah. <laughs> unless you can get the link from somebody, um, sometimes they have a, a couple of episodes floating around here and there. Actually, I think there might be four episodes on YouTube of last seasons. Mm. So uh, basically, how I got involved was I was working with um, Friendly Filmworks, and um, <clears throat> Ara and Lara are the producers that work for that company, and they met up with Holger, who was the showrunner, executive producer of, uh, you know, X Factor Beyond Belief. And they, at that point, they're just talking about trying to get something going. So we ended up like shooting a pilot um, where we shot all the LA Jonathan Frakes stuff. Like I shot all of that, all the standups, you know, all the throws between the episodes kind of thing. And then they took that back and they shot the, actual stories for that episode in Germany mm. and they like, cause the Germans just love 
X Factor is what they call it, Beyond Belief. Um, and Jonathan Frakes is like a superstar over there. Um, so they were all about it. They did a bunch of focus groups and things, and they said they loved it. But one of the biggest things that they missed was like the dubbed aspect of it and like being made in the US. Or really? Into Germany. Yeah. It was like they really liked the cheesiness, I guess, or like. Okay what that kind of did to the to the whole experience and by not having that in the pilot they felt like it was missing that so worked out well for us because that means all the stuff would be shot over here so they did end up picking that up um we shot what would have been the fifth season of beyond belief or like they were calling it the you know the first season of x factor here in the u.s right at you know um for all the sag contracts or whatever you know you got to be very specific of what you call it um and yeah so then it's like 40 short films um shot throughout ep eight episodes so like nine weeks it's it's a different short film every single day jeez so new location new cast new script um and a lot of times new director as well i know for my first, the first, the first season we had like, I want to say 13 directors or something like that throughout the 80, uh, short films. Um, and then, yeah, so it's, a, it's definitely a grind and every day trying to come up with something new and like try to feel like the old show and be creative at the same time. Um, so then this past season, <clears throat> And also there was an, there was a German DP who had shot the stories in Germany and he would come over and shoot like a week's worth of the stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next on the following season, they didn't end up uh, hiring me for the main season. Um, but like Flo got hung up in the German DP got hung up in customs and last minute they needed somebody. And I had worked with Rena, the director who was coming over to work with Flo. Um, and he was like, yeah, let's get Nick and, you know, I came in and I worked for those that week um, on this sixth season. Um, yeah, and it worked great. You know, it turned out great. So, how many? Uh, you might have already said it, but I blacked out. What? Uh, how many of those little shorts did you end up shooting? So, for the, I got hung up on the eighty number. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was four, 40 total. I shot thirty two the first season, and then I shot eight this past season, and. Uh, Eddie Salerno shot the other 32. So what does pre-production look like on 30? Or do you just have like one lighting package and show up and go like, I'll figure it out when I get there? For Well, it's a, it's a little bit of that, but we did have one package for the entire season. Um, mm -hmm. I know on the first or like the fifth season, I guess, um, we tried to get as much done as we could beforehand. So we were having like a lot of meetings where we would kind of go through and have like a mini production meeting and like a virtual scout. Um, and we would talk with as much as we could. And like, it was basically asking the directors to be prepped, like, you know, months and months in advance of their episodes. Um, and then some were able to get a bunch of information. And then like, I feel like the first month or so, like we, we were really solid. And then, like, there started to be things that were still getting figured out for for the additional episodes, whether it was script changes, location changes, things like that. But, you know, there's still things that are getting figured out along the way. Um, so, like, that first two weeks, we had, like, a very specific plan, and then it would start to become more and more general and be based on, like, some directors, they would come into town, and they'd be coming from Germany, and they'd get into town, and give me a call and we'd hang out all weekend and we'd go in and we'd be super planned. And then other ones were like on set all the way up until the day before we were shooting. And, you know, like we did a lot of figuring it out on the go. Um, and it just was a lot of, yeah, like filmmaking boot camp. You know, here's the issues. How are we going to, how are we going to solve this problem today? This is what, this was our plan, but we're here at a different time or it's raining or something's happening. So we need to do something completely different you know what's your idea is go you know and that's every day something new and yeah that uh it does sound you know i was talking to uh bob yeoman who shot uh all the wes anderson stuff and he was saying that wes really likes to have it feel like a film school set 
you know, like f- very few people on Asteroid City, they almost had no film lights. Like they were just, you know, that, and, uh, I imagine that was kind of a similar vibe. You're shooting 32 in one case, fucking short films <laughs> yeah. and you're just like, ah, figure it out, go. Sure. No, I mean, we, we definitely use lighting as much as possible. And we, we were lucky that we were able to like kind of go into every set with a, with a plan of some sort and, and get it going. Uh, but certainly there was always something new that you weren't ever thinking of that like maybe if it was just that one short that you were shooting, you know, you might've caught that, but since it's, you know, this is the fifth one this week, nobody was paying attention to the fact that the sun was going to set at that time or like we were, they had scheduled it this way or that, you know? So <clears throat> how do you keep that kind of energy? Cause you're shooting those all consecutively, right? Like there's not really too many sure. breaks. How do you no, keep that? Weekends. How do you keep, I mean, at least that's nice. How do you keep that like energy up and, and keep attempting to stay consistent? I know, uh, Oren Soffer told me that you, one thing he learned on the creator was you can only plan for about three weeks, three, four weeks. And then after that, it's just, you know, you try to keep the thing rolling, but it's up to God at that point. <laughs> sure. Well, that makes me feel better because I'm like, man, does every, is this like this for everybody? Or Apparently. Just- yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a lot of information to to take in. Um, you know, I think it's just we're kind of like gluttons for punishment. The people, you know, me anyway. Like, I this is something that I love to do. I love telling stories, love solving problems. So it's kind of like a dream every day. I got to wake up and and solve something new. It certainly can be frustrating at times, but you know, we're we're here telling stories and uh, you know, creating cool things and like narrative is always fun um you know and it's always fun to push the boundaries and try to come up with new ways to tell stories so that and you know like we were kind of open to letting the crew uh work on other projects since it was so long and um some you know there would be definitely like different budgets that were coming through so when when the crew's rotating out then you'd have like maybe a new operator or a new gaffer that you're working with and like we're doing something a little bit different than we were doing last week because, you know, they're just bringing fresh eyes to it in something new. So no. like just the constant changing, constant new, new directors that you're working with, new actors, new cast, just new, new location just gives you more inspiration and, you know, variety. come up with how to, how we're going to do it today. And like, th- this is the exact same shot, the exact same idea, but let's figure out a way to do it differently. So we're telling the same story, but not doing exactly what we did on episode 39 or you know, whatever it was. Right. So what was, uh, cause you know, the, the original show, I certainly loved the original show, but sure. that we look at it now as potentially being cheesy. I, you know, obviously Jonathan Frakes uh, doing those standups is like a meme at this point where he had, nope, we made it up, whatever. Uh, but I think that lighting, especially that hard, you know, like purple backlight and just that, all that like atmosphere and diffusion and stuff is more indicative of the time, not necessarily like low budget. That was actually probably a decent budget at the time. Did you guys, were you attempting to like kind of pay homage to that or were you doing your own thing or what was kind of the, um, amalgam of, of those two ideas? Yeah, I think it was a little bit of both. Uh, We wanted to keep a lot of the same elements of the original show, but the original show is, you know, it's like shot on 16 millimeter. They had, probably two days for every episode they had like cranes and you know big dollies and all these things that we weren't just going to have weren't going to have and they just had a budget and support that we would have never gotten um so it was a little bit of like let's keep the feeling and the idea of the old show let's do everything we can to like knock the edge off of the modern look let's use vintage lenses you know nice alexa camera we only did 2k at some point we were talking about like running it all through a vcr or something like that to just like take it down even further because a lot of the you know a lot of the old show being shown now you know like the colors and the the exposure is nowhere near what a modern tv show would be um they think they did we dropped that idea and kind of just kept the look that we had with the alexa and like the standard speeds and then this previous year we used the black magic um so yeah um it was basically like we like we they did a lot of like moving masters so we tried to you know have 
a steady cam operator or something like that to kind of help create that feeling. Um, a lot of times that would be something that we would push the directors to kind of come up with is to figure out a way that we could do like a big move through and cover a bunch of the scene with that and then pick up that extra coverage that they needed to get through it. And that could kind of like help us feel big budget, but you know, do it faster and at the budget that we were really at. Mm -hmm. uh, and then certainly once we got to the Jonathan Frake stuff, it was like trying to be as much like Jonathan Frake's the old, the old look as we could. So we were, you know, getting our blue, you know, Lico's coming in through all the windows and as much haze as we could. And certainly like Jonathan Frakes would always look at me and be like, you need more haze really? You know, <laughs> I was like, this is your show. This is the look, man. You know, and he loved it, but mm -hmm. yeah, he's a trooper. He was like always in there smiling, have a good time. I know during like the, um, pilot, we needed to have like AC in there and it was just not really working so well. And he was just like smoking and joking and having a great time with the crew. And I felt like it was his attitude that kind of like got everybody through without being just like super miserable the whole time. Cause you know, everybody was 900 degrees for that time. So certainly right. when we came back, they had like, it was cold because they had so much, uh, stuff being pumped into it. Um, we did have that issue again. Well, and I imagine too, like Frakes is, a, is an incredibly accomplished director in his own right. You know, he's yeah. obviously directed, uh, clock stoppers. No. Um, but you know, all you know, so that's like, that got talked about a lot on set. Really? Yeah. I know like one of the ACs was like a big fan of clock stoppers. So he would always bring it up and like, yeah, no, it, it got talked about quite a bit. And certainly like at some point, you know, Jonathan Frakes was like, push the dolly grip off the dolly and he was like playing around and pushing the dolly. So he was just like a good all around guy. And, you know, he knew who to, who to joke around with and who to give like extra appreciation to, you know, and like, he's already always ribbing the producers and giving them a hard time and then pumping up, you know, whatever PA was close by. So, you know, he really helped like bring a great attitude toward back to the set. And that was like, you know, week eight or nine. So, you know, it was certainly like an infusion of more energy, right? When he gets in and he's just nailing it and he's got these big long blocks and he's just rolling through it and having a good time. Um, makes everybody else kind of want to do better work. And yeah. yeah. Well, I, you kind of answered it there, but I'll, I'll push a little further if, if you have it, the, um, him being a director and, and clearly like taking a, a leadership role in some degree on the show. Was there anything you kind of learned from him that um, you would might take on as as a uh, department head, you know, into your next gigs beyond just like being the kind of guy that pays attention to the crew and, and make sure, sure everyone's in good mood? Yeah, I mean, I think he just attacked everything with positivity and, um, you know, did everything he could to do his best and elevate the people around him in a positive way. Um, even maybe when things weren't, going as smoothly as possible he's still while he might be arguing with somebody over here he's still having fun with somebody on this side and still letting everybody else have that same feeling while they're fixing whatever drama needs to be fixed at the same time so i think that's something that i learned is just kind of like trying to keep yourself composed and, and like always keep us driving forward towards the the goal um like no matter what's trying to get in our way yeah what uh you mentioned that you switched from the uh, Alexa with the, what did you say, the classic? The, not the classic. It was the thief. standards or super standards, speed. super speeds. Super speeds. What, um, what was the shooting pack? You said, uh, the black, it was a black magic 12 K. What, um, same lenses, um, different lenses. We had like easy zooms. We had, um, some like a Sigma set of lenses, like PL lenses mm. and then like a longer Canon, like 30 to 300 zoom. Um, so yeah, it was quite a different package. Um, but they went through, like, ended up getting like a, a sponsorship from black magic and, uh, um, all these things that like helped out to bring that camera in. And I wasn't as much a part of the selection there. Um, I did get like, when I did come in, Eddie had done all these tests. He had all kinds of ways that like he wanted to overexpose and really get the most out of the cameras. Um, so yeah, I just kind of like 
read his little Bible that he sent me when I was coming in and all the, all the technical notes and did my best to take all that with me and, um, you know, implement them as, as much as possible. So what, what were some of those tips? Cause they actually sent me a 12 K to review and I, I couldn't really review it cause I just, you turn it on, you're like, wow, that looks really nice. And that was like the best I had. I was like, I can't write. It looks really nice. That's not a review. That's a bad article, you know? Sure. I mean, no, it did a great job. I mean, um, you know, we didn't, I never really, I coming from the Alexa going to it, definitely like the range seemed to be there. Um, they, it, it did a good job capturing it. We were usually trying to overexpose one or two stops. He, Eddie had created like two different LUTs, um, one with a, like a one stop push and one with a two stop push. So like as, as we were getting darker, we were trying to keep giving the the sensor as much light, um, but be monitoring and like everybody's seeing something that's much darker um, so that we know that there's plenty of information for the colorist. Um, but like on set, we're not looking at it and going, oh man, that's too bright. Um, right. And certainly like that was all Eddie was always pushing like, let's, more light, more light. Let's give it more light. So anything we could do, um, he was always like looking at the waveform monitor, getting like taking everything all the way up to where it like would almost would be clipping and then bring it back just a little bit mm -hmm. uh, so that you have as the fattest negative that you could going into um, post-production. Were you shooting B-Raw? Um, yes. Yeah. It, I think it was like eight to one. Like bit rate. Yeah. I find that's good enough. Yeah. No, I, or even 12 in some no. cases, like. And like we, we, we could have shot 12 K. I think we, we generally shot 8 K to try to keep the, you know, file sizes the down. heroes down, the file sizes down. Um, every now and then when it would be like really dark and we didn't think, feel like we had enough light. So one of the tricks we would have would be like, you know, put it in 12 K. Uh, and then like, I guess that would make your grain a little bit smaller. So then when we came back into post, everything's getting smaller. So like mm. it was a little bit more grainy, but you could perceptibly feel it a little bit less because, you know, we were kind of making it much smaller. Yeah. That's actually something like when the arguments about, I think these, these have started to go by the wayside because storage is a lot cheaper and most cameras shoot 4k, but especially when 4k and even 8k was coming out specifically for you everyone was like well what's there's no need for it everything's in 1080 anyway and i but you, exactly what you said like the noise pattern when it's been down just gets averaged out yeah especially like especially on a larger sensor i know the the um 12k is just a uh, not just but it's a crop sensor but either way like higher resolutions when displayed will give you a lower noise pattern generally yeah absolutely and i thought that was a really creative way that like Eddie had come up with um, to get around that. So yeah, he, you know, when he first said, it, I was like, what? And then I was like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. You're right. It, it You know, it's going to go away by the time they brought it back to what it needs to be. And then, yeah, I'm sure like the colorist was softening, softening it and blurring it even further when they got into post, because that was the look, right? They're trying to knock it down and get it back into this world of yeah. millimeter film, you know, transfer to so you guys were you guys doing like a like a film print emulation or was it just more kind of the the vibe less than the there, literal aesthetic i think both of our luts had you know like origins with some type of emulation um i know that like we used started with like the there's like a kodak lut in resolve yep um, we kind of started with that as a base the first year i'm not sure kind of where eddie started um when he created the left for the second season. Um, but that's where we started in the, the first season. So, yeah, you had mentioned, uh, having one lighting package going through all of it. What was that package and how were you, um, how did it tend to get used? Like, you know, were oh geez, were you just, um, you know, was it like big soft source for everything or was, you know, were you a lot of LEDs, a lot of tongues? So what, what were you guys up to? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, um, I know for the first season we had like a 4k and an m18 um and like a bunch of light mats so it would kind of always be like 
putting that 4K out of a window, getting that coming through somewhere. Um, and then the M18 is picking something else up or coming through a different window, different character. And then we were just taking those light mats and putting them, rigging them somewhere in the frame to kind of like pick a, a location up. Or if we have like a following shot, the locations, you know, the light mats are always easy to like rig, but tuck away. Uh, so yeah, we did, we had those, you know, had lots of the tubes. I think like when you're trying to be fast, uh, certainly like a stereotubes, maybe not the like the quality of light that you want, but they don't have to run any cable. We can get it up there and you can get up there right now and put a little honey crate on it or something. And now it's nice and controlled and we're only hitting where we need to be. Um, so it was a lot of actually a stair tubes and magnets or something just getting stuck up real quick down and dirty. Um, every single day, I, I, I wish I had any uh, other people working on this podcast because there's a few things like this that I that I want, but one of them is to just go through all of them and cut out the mention, not like remove, but cut out the mention of the of the Astera tubes because every single DP is like, yeah, those things saved my life at one point. <laughs> sure, I mean, and they have like they're just a great tool, and you know they came on the scene and like started off with them in music videos, and it was like you could just do all of these effects rebuilt like they the the app just always like had something extra to it and worked well from the beginning and had like interesting pixel controlled effects that didn't look as boxed as like some of these other lights did so yeah the astero tubes have just been great you know they they have they actually over here they sent me they have these things called the hydro panels have you heard of those i haven't they're like this big, um, I don't know what that is, like maybe 10 inches. Yeah. Maybe yeah. And they have- They uh, link together? Yeah, you can link them together and they have like magnetic diffusion fronts that you can swap out and stuff and same app, same everything. And those those are actually pretty, um, I'm trying to write a review for those because the tube, for some reason, the tubes feel like they have more utility, but they can't. Like they're they're much bigger than the little bricks, but like the- it's it's something fast because I feel like we're so used to like Kino tubes, especially mm -hmm. that our brains are just wired to accept that that's the kind of light we want. Whereas the brick lights almost feel like an LED panel, which we instinctively want to soften more, sure, or put you know make bigger. Yeah, well, I mean, one of them's ten inches and one of them's four inches or four feet, so you definitely have a huge difference in the softness and the quality already. I feel like one of the biggest issues with a smaller light is like am i going to pull this out get it all set up and i'm going to be just not enough right and so then i end up grabbing that four foot of stereo tube because i know like i can bring it down to one percent and get it closer to that level if i need it but if i bring out this little guy and it's not enough yeah right, i'm gonna have to take more time to go get that guy again but at the same time like just having all these little lights that are attached to you know apps and magnetized and you can like stuff it under a monitor and like put it on all these places and be able to dial it on the fly or like put it on the you know the camera and like it's pushing in and you're like dialing it down in the app as they're pushing it in and the, the, the level staying the same it's just lots of things that you're capable to do these days with lights and things like that out of the box that come with an app that you don't need to have a board op and a programmer and somebody that's going to take extra time to figure, to get that rig logged into the board correctly and then have full control. You can down and dirty, pull it out, do it on your app. Yeah. The, I mean, the asterisks. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The second you don't have Wi-Fi or an iPad dies, you're like, well, yeah. doing it manually. The, uh, I mean, one thing that I love about the hydro panels do it. I don't, I assume the tubes do it, but just like being able to put X, Y coordinates in stuff. So you can just like meter the, you know, the incoming window light and then just change all the lights to that. Sure. I, I want to like, I will, unless I'm forced to, I, I don't think I ever want to work on a set where I either don't have lights that have a, an app or can't all be wireless DMX'd into like that rat pack with Centena or whatever it is, the, yeah. the main iPad app. Cause it's just so fucking convenient and just setting up a light and then never having to bring it back down to fiddle the, oh God. hundred percent. It's great. I mean, like we were, I was just on set recently. We had a celebrity and like 
we weren't going to get time to make adjustments. So, uh, you know, we were able to hook all that stuff up and the gaffer is standing right next to me at the monitor and, you know, we can't get around out there and take a meeting, but reading, but we have the waveform up and we're like, oh yeah, give a little more on the background, a little less on his face there. And he's dialing it all in. And, you know, while the director is out there talking and everything is happening and we're not interrupting or being a distraction, but we're getting to make these adjustments and, and do it on the fly. Uh, at the same time, you also have times where you're, you're whatever, for whatever reason, there's ghosts in the machines and you got like six lights and you're like, just turn them on. And you know, something's going on with the app and, and they weren't <laughs> and just like, can we just walk out to them and click them on? But then all the settings won't be the same. And yeah, everybody just give me five more minutes. You know, yeah. it is, it is funny that like, I get, yeah, the, the, where you spend the time has just shifted, right? Because before it was, you'd flick on the, the mole beam or whatever, and then you spend half an hour just like moving in diffusion panels and like scrims and stuff and kind of, you know, trying to take it off the wall. Now, you know, you just in DaVinci throw a window on whatever that wall was. You don't need to put that down, you know, whatever, but you're right. Like the second the app dies or whatever, you're like, well, I forgot how to do it the real way. What? <laughs> Exactly. You're like, why is it taking so long? So, but most of the time it works really well. I mean, I feel like it, especially when we're actually given the time and they have like a prep day to get everything looked up into the app, as opposed to like, we're yeah, trying to fly, light it, program it and do it all together. And, you know, unfortunately I've had plenty of budgets where we're, we're doing all of that stuff at the same time. And that definitely makes it more, ha more chaotic and things start failing and then, you know, it's a little bit more crazy, but it is, you get it figured out. It is funny how I, I've, I've never been on a set that has shot film, but everyone always talks about how everyone like slows down, you know, cause you have to. And I'm always wondering like, how can we instill that in digital sets, so to speak? Because like, it's crazy that you show up and Cause I've had this happen plenty of times where like you, you're getting the first light, like the first out of maybe six lights set up and the director, whoever, you know, who producer is like, how, how much longer is this going to take? And you're like, dude, what? I can't, I can't remember. I think it was, I was talking to someone or maybe it was a special feature that I was watching and they were like, you know, you, they're spending 40 minutes laying a cable and then everyone's just sitting around looking at actors going like, why is this taking so long? You're like, the cable got 40 minutes. It's like, but it does work the reverse way. Yeah. I mean, if you, they expect it just takes time to do things, you know, like, and if you want to do it right, it takes, it takes time. So you, the, uh, I think one, one thing, like whenever you have bigger talent on set, I feel like you have a similar kind of effect. Um, mm. I think it's just like, Oh, have people slowing down or, going to or just like being more um diligent not necessarily slowing down i I guess when i when you said slowing down i thought it was like when people i feel like when film comes out people are like are more on top of their game yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, we can only do this twice and it costs it costs money every time we hit that record button and, and like start you hear those you know reels rolling versus like on digital you can push the button and just and roll forever right uh, and I think there's certain type of films that like maybe a comedy or something where you want to not have being limited to your thousand foot mag or whatever it is. Um, and you want to just give them the freedom to roll. And then there's other times when you want the control and you, you don't need the extra and you go out there and you get very specifically what you need. Um, and I, you know, usually I think those come out better when the more planning and more specific you are, the better it comes out. But sometimes you go out there and throw the plan out the window and wing it and get something even better. Just kind of reacting to, to what's actually happening. So, yeah. What, uh, I saw on your Instagram, you, you had shot a movie relatively was, I, I keep trying to say hell or high water. That doesn't sound right. That was a still happen to fury. There you go. Hell or high water is a TV show, I think, or something. But, uh, what was, what was There's that? Too. I was a movie. Yeah. What, uh, what was that one about? I didn't even look it up. I just saw that right before we started talking about what's that about. And like, is a horror film? Cause I know you've done some it's of like those. It's like a, it's like a horror thriller kind of thing. It's basically, um, it's kind of like there was another woman in, uh, the garden of Eden before Eve. Um, mm. it's kind of like 
cast out. And then there's like a modern recreation of like Eve, Adam and Eve. And he, she's coming back to get him in this modern world. And it's kind of like, he's the leader of a mental facility. And he's kind of like watching over all these people and like, slowly they all start to go a little more crazy and kill each other and he starts getting blamed and um it just kind of like slowly slips into pandemonium and gets even crazier and crazier so um it was a cool project to be a part of we like got hooked up with the panavision dxl and like some really cool cool ultra speed lenses um and they really threw everything in and supported us and like kind of gave us the whole package of like extra batteries mo- you know zooms like fun uh diopters with like holes drilled in the middle of them so that we could do like these funky effects of people like coming in and out of consciousness or like seeing a like uh you know some type of visual like hallucination and you know just kind of like throwing things off a little bit so that was a lot of fun um it was like a 22 day shoot where we had like 30 to 30 locations or something like that. Jeez. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, but we, we got it done and, um, got it all in the can and they're, they're working on it right now. So I, all the cuts I've seen have been pretty interesting. So hopefully we'll have something soon to, to show. Max, nice. When, uh, was that come out probably next year? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think they, they have like a sales trailer and they're trying to to sell it so i think that'll you know it w- they wanted to have it out like december of last year but you, you know everything kind of slips and so i think in the next couple months um i have that coming out and then i did i shot another feature after that called restitution uh, mm-hmm. with ninth house films um i'm really excited about that one as well i've just kind of heard recently that they had their first cut done and everybody was really excited. So I'm hoping I get to see that. That was like another one that was super short and it was just kind of like, we would run like 10 minute takes and it was just the majority of the film was a guy like tied to the chair, tied to a chair. And it was like a woman that was getting like revenge on him and basically like kind of torturing him for most of the movie. So it was a short shooting schedule, but it worked out because you know, it was, mainly me figuring out different ways to like cover her walking around him doing crazy stuff. And I like really got to like play with the camera and the performers, the actors were so good and just able to like do these stunts over and over and over again. Cause they were like already stunt people before they were like, Oh, that's nice. trying to be creative actors. So they just like, they were always hitting it and I was handheld and just kind of like felt like I was, always getting to the right spots. And I just felt like everything was working out perfectly. And we'd have these 10 minute takes, but like, I was like, man, you could use probably that one take if you wanted to and get through this whole scene. So hell yeah, I'm excited to see that, how that one comes up. We shot it out in like Tehachapi, like on the side of a mountain. So like definitely like all this, uh, carnage that's happening in this really beautiful, um, location. So I'm really interested to see how that one comes out. I did, I did want to know, uh, before we wrapped up, um, just Googling you, I saw earlier, like a couple of weeks ago, you, you headed a, an advanced cinema workshop, is it advanced cinematography workshop? Um, uh, or was that someone else that shares your name? Maybe I, I definitely have done some like teaching of, of things. Oh, that was last year. I know how yeah. numbers work. February of 2023. <laughs> Yeah, so I I actually have a friend that's a teacher at a private school, um, mm-hmm. and like lots of big named people have their kids there, and they have like a TV studio and that they can like take as an elective course. Um, so yeah, he, he brought me in there and like would have basically like a filmmaking workshop with various age kids from like middle school to high school. Uh, we would do like different types of light, a lighting workshop, or we like would go through, look at some of my work, show like the older kids, like, Oh, I went to Chapman. This is kind of like some things I did to apply. This is like what I wrote about or whatever. Um, and then like tailor it to each specific class. So yeah, it was kind of interesting. I'm actually supposed to do it again 
um, in a couple of weeks here at the same school. So, wow, oh, nice. I'm, uh, the reason I wanted to bring it up, A, I mean, it's just cool, but B, uh, I'm always fascinated to know what younger students or younger filmmakers are interested in, um, uh, both visually and, and also like what their, um, kind of main focus is as creators. Cause I, it's gotta be different from, I, I think we're roughly the same age, like when we were kids and, and, you know, when, when our, the generation before us was probably far more interested in a Scorsese like film versus, you know, me, which I was much more into like a matrix or a men in black type film, you know? So yeah. What are the, what are they kind of talk about? What are they interested? What's, what excites them? Well, I mean, they are just like inundated with video and, and uh, like platforms at a young age. So like you have some kids that are in there and they have their own YouTube channels and like, they're very specific. Like they're trying to make short films that look specifically like other films. And then you have other kids that like, they want to be an influencer and like, that's what their page is. And they're trying to capture that kind of stuff. Um, so I think it's, you know, more about them creating their own channel and, and creating their own content than like going off and being on a film set or like working on a big movie. At least a lot of these kids, there are like, you know, maybe three or four in every class that you're like, they're like, I'm going to film school and this is my plan, you know, but a lot of them, you know, were just in the class because they thought it was fun and they weren't necessarily looking to be a filmmaker or grow up to do that. But Sure. So it's all depends. You know. Well, and it's, you know, it's, uh, we're painting a wide brush with a small, uh, selection of students, but, uh, I, I, I figured it would, it is interesting. Cause like, I feel like most people who get into creative fields besides acting don't want to be, <laughs> as some people say, perceived, you know, I certainly don't love being in front of the camera. I don't mind it. I mean, I was in, I was in theater school, like I was in theater in high school and shit. And like, I don't mind acting, but that's not my, I don't want people to be looking at me, but it does feel like now, especially because YouTube, especially, but you know, TikTok, whatever is so personality based that that does, if you're raised with that, maybe that is creating like a whole generation of people who are far more outgoing just in sure. general, you know, like yeah. the nerds, like it's cooler to be a nerd now than it ever was for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely the culture these days. They, it, you know, they're making fun of the cool kids. Right. right? Um, yeah. I mean, I think that they're, they're just used to it and they're inundated from an early age and, you know, like they, they have friends that every day and they're standing in front of their computer and, and trying to be an influencer, you know, everybody Everybody wants to be famous, I, you know, these yeah. days. It feels like, you know, they, I want to be selling this product and be sponsored and being all this stuff. And it feels like a lot of the, the kids in the classes are saying those kind of things, either that, or it's like talking about whatever the critically acclaimed films are. And, you know, I'm like, I don't think you guys really like that movie as much as you said. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I like that was in film school. And I didn't like all that stuff. So I, I don't know. Every, every kid who it, uh, cause I went to college in 2008 and every kid who went, oh yeah, my favorite movie is generally Citizen Kane. I'm like, no, it fucking isn't. Yeah. No, it no, isn't. It, you read that you read it supposed to be right. Like maybe you liked one thing that they did, but like nobody likes to watch that movie anymore. I don't think. No, I mean, it's yeah. In, it's, until you're I older. See where cool things came from, like, like camera tricks. And that's interesting that that's the first time that they did it, but like. No, I can't say that I've ever like been able to sit through the entire thing without like making myself like you're right. going to sit through this. We're going to see Rosebud and, right. <laughs> and not fall asleep. That's right. The, uh, it is interesting though. You'd mentioned it and I, and I've been thinking about that for a while. A lot of YouTube is so highly polished, especially when they get floated, you know, free gear and stuff, free lenses, cameras, whatever. But at the end of the day, they're just selling stuff. You know, it's a lot of it might be couched in a review or whatever, but like at the end of the day, that's everyone is very, very excited now to sell products. And I'm like, mean, that's, that's a, that's a different thing now. Like personally, like, the making commercials is cool, but to personally be like, hi, my name's Kenny and I'm selling you this light is, is like kind of interesting to me. A little foreign. 
Yeah. I mean, every it's everybody wants to be the influencer. And now like, you know, they'll, if you put your code up, they'll give you 10% off kind of thing as so it's like, there's, I, I know like Lynn's baby, they, you know, you can be a ambassador or something, but really all that means is like, you're going to take a bunch of pictures and post them on their website, you know, and they'll give you a 10% off, but like, it seems like a lot of work, you know, yeah. it's only giving them a bunch of photos, but I guess at the end of the day, it's exposure, it's, you know, practice those kinds of things, but I'd rather like be hired to shoot those photos than. Yeah. And you actually make money when you're hired. Right. <laughs> But it's, you know, it's a different, I think like, it's just a different way of looking. I know like I've seen plenty of people that only have done the YouTube and, or only are posting on their own Instagram channels and they're, they start off at a certain level and then you can watch them throughout the years, just getting better and better and better. And like with the technology and the access that we have to things these days, it's like the only reason that it doesn't look good is because you're not taking the time to figure out why. I mean, like everybody has a phone in their pocket that looks better than, you know, a 5D or whatever. Yeah. Uh, when that was revolutionizing the game. So now like everybody has access to that in their pocket and they like cinema mode, like, oh, I can shoot log on my iPhone. Like there's That's so much technology available to everybody. I know, uh, a plenty of people have bemoaned the idea of people saying like, oh, if you, you know, if you're just getting started, just shoot on your phone. And everyone always goes like, well, oh, you just don't get it. That's not enough. No, it's like, dude, that new iPhone, I'm not an Apple fanboy. I don't own, I have one iPad, but I don't, it's very old. I don't like Apple that much, but they really have knocked it out of the park with combined with the black magic camera app. That is a perfectly reasonable camera to yeah. shoot anything on for, you know, especially if you're starting out. Sure. I mean, I have commercials that I'm shooting with running around with the Alexa and shooting that. And the director is like right over my shoulder with his new iPhone and he's shooting stuff and they're cutting the stuff in together. I mean, it's not like they're not trying to cut back and forth in a conversation and make you feel like it's the same thing. It's like a, you know, a video that has all types of videos in it. So you'll just accept that. Right. The video drops down a little bit of the quality here for this moment because you just watched three other testimonial videos that were created on somebody's iPhone edited with this all together. So like just the expectation of the viewer allows for so much more these days. Um, like we're, we're going to accept all that stuff. You can, people will accept bad video long before they'll accept like bad audio, right? hundred um, percent. So you can shoot it with whatever you want as long as like people can get the gist of it. They're going to enjoy it. You know, like if it's good, it doesn't matter if you shoot it on your phone or your, or, a, you know, DSLR or film or whatever. Yeah. People are going to enjoy it and they're going to watch it. So. Well, and, and that new iPhone shoots uh ProRes raw, which is nuts. Like, <laughs> Yeah. I don't know how you're supposed to get it out of there with USB two speeds out of the port, but that's another it's, conversation. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, like you can go in and with the LiDAR, like you can be shooting video and shoot the focus and it auto focuses and it changes it and does it the way you don't want it to. And then you go back later and you can change the focus back to what you wanted it to be. Like now, obviously it's their masking, right? That's right. happening. It's not, you're not changing the physical lens focus, but like you can make a big difference, right? Yeah. Like I have a little, like the, I got a glow forward. So I have like a little store where I make slates and Christmas ornaments and customized slates for movies and things and uh basically like i don't know got my foot they lost my train of thought there <laughs> where was i going with that uh making stuff with the iphone uh raw res raw uh low forges are cool <laughs> yeah no uh, there cool. is cool no the focus thing oh oh, oh sure thing, like me putting the video, you know, a video of me putting an ornament onto a tree or something, and the, it rat focused to an ornament that was back on the back of the tree and then came back to my hand. And I was able to go through, change the focus to keep it all on the, the ornament that I wanted it to be on. Um, and it's just crazy what you can do in the phone. Um, you know, then that, that's, that's coming, right? All that information all that technology is slowly but surely coming into um, 
the to our area. Like, I don't know if you ever use like a Ronin 4D or anything. Like I've that. never used one, but I've certainly seen them. I mean, they have some crazy technology that's in there. They have like the LiDAR on top of, you can put LiDAR on top of the camera that makes any lens autofocus. Right. Uh, you can select people in the frame and they walk around and the, the gimbal will pan and follow them. I mean, it's just, there's lots of technology that's coming that is just making it's so much easier to create things. Um, well, even, even the selective focus thing as well, because do you remember the, I think it was called the Lytro camera. Yeah. It's it like, like our thing. Yeah. No, it had like 40 lenses on it or something. And it would, it would record essentially like the entire space in 3d from, it was an enormous box. I mean, it looked bigger than like, um, football or, you know, like sports box lenses bigger than that. It was huge. They had, and it was at NAB in like 2012 or something. And they were like, you're going to be able to film and select focus later. And everyone was like, this is crazy. This is going to change the game. And then they went out of business and now you can do it on an iPhone. And it was like, it was like a billion dollar project. It was nuts. Yeah. Well, it's like, that's just the beginning, right? So it didn't work out for them, but now the technology is here to support it. And yeah, it's, it's wild what you can do, um, on these phones, man. Like so cool. Like yeah. pushing the boundaries and I'm sure like. An Android phone probably always does it first, but I definitely am an <laughs> iPhone boy. And so like, I'll take it once they get it figured out and fixed. So it works every time. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, I got a, I got a pixel, which does not have amazing. I mean, it looks, the video looks good, but it, the features are not anywhere close. Once black magic makes up Android, app, will be I, good. we can't send you any pictures. So like, I you know. know that's Apple's fault. What, who I had, who I'm like dragging stuff into my computer messages with and like specific gaffers of like, get it in there. I always try to send it to them. It always fails. Like that's Apple's fault. An iPhone. Once, once they, once they incorporate RCS, we'll be in better shape. I think they're doing that later in the year. Um, we've got a little over, so I'll let you go, but uh, it was really great talking to you, man. Um, uh, when, when those other two films, you know, come back out, we'll have you back. We can, once I can see them, we'll just <laughs> talk about that. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Really appreciate you having me. It was fun. Look forward to listening to this one and uh, your Orin software one. That should be pretty cool too. Yeah, that's uh, tomorrow. Oh, awesome. So when when people listen to this, it'll be like weeks ago, but it does for us, it comes out tomorrow. Well, that's exciting. I'm I'm excited to hear what he says about the, the FX3. I know that like I'm, it's a great little camera and like it obviously they've done some amazing things with it. So yeah. I would say as a primer to, this is for you and for anyone listening, uh, as a primer to the, to that podcast, the one I did listen to the shot craft episode, he and, um, uh, um, Greg Frazier did. Okay. With, with, uh, because I listened to that basically it's like two hours long. I listened to that to know what not to ask. That, sure. that a little secret that I have is I just listen to everyone else's podcasts and then I don't address that or follow up. You know, because who wants to listen to, you know, it's like your favorite DP and then you listen to three podcasts in a row and you're like, it's the same thing three times. It's like, not here. There you go. <laughs> it's also going to be deep. different. Um, awesome, man. Well, like I said, I'll let you go and, and, and thanks again for, for chatting with me. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Look forward to it. Hope to talk to you again soon. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. If you'd like to support the podcast directly, you can go to frameandrefpod.com and follow the link to buy me a coffee. It's always appreciated, and as always, thanks for listening.